Welcome back to Clinicians Brief, the podcast, where we get to explore the conversations behind all of your favorite Clinicians Brief content. I'm your host, Dr. Alyssa Watson, and I'm so glad that you could join us again for today's episode. Today, we are bringing back a very popular guest who has written a pair of articles for Clinicians Brief aimed at improving your orthopedic examination skills. Joining us today is Dr. Kate Barnes, an associate professor of small animal orthopedic surgery at Texas A&M University. If you remember, we had the privilege of discussing thoracic limb lameness with Dr. Barnes previously, but today we will be turning our attention to the back half of the dog, and we will be talking all about localizing pelvic limb lameness in the dog. So Dr. Barnes, thank you for joining us again. If you wouldn't mind um, just kind of reviewing anybody that didn't get to catch your previous episode, maybe reviewing your credentials for us, let us know how you made it to Texas A&M. (laughs) <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. Um, I am originally from Connecticut, uh, started vet school at Ross University. After about a year and a half, I transferred to Oregon State, uh, where I graduated from there a while ago. Uh, did my internship at Cornell, uh, residency at Virginia Tech, and then I was on faculty at LSU for a couple of years uh, before joining the faculty at Texas A&M. Fantastic. So I know you guys have had a little bit of a cold snap down there. We're in Vegas and we have two. So the temperature dropped, you know, a good 30, 40 degrees in just a day or so. (laughs) Yep. I've got my blanket on me trying to keep warm. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Let's talk about lameness in the pelvic limb. Um, Our previous episode, we started off the episode by talking about some key features of an ideal area to perform a gait evaluation. And obviously that is, you know, topical for today's conversation as well. Um, So I would like to just briefly run through those again. Could you run through those key features of where we need to be doing these exams? Yeah, absolutely. And it is super important to get a good gait exam in, um, not only to kind of confirm what the owners say, but I guess that is a big part, confirming what they think. And sometimes owners aren't quite sure what leg is lame or they're looking at them and think it's a left when it's actually their left and not the dog's left. So it is really, really important. And anywhere where we can get a good exam where there's not a lot of distractions, which I know is hard to find sometimes, and often someplace where we can walk them in a longer stretch to get a good exam. So someplace where we can kind of watch them from the front, from the back, and from the side is very helpful. And then probably one of the most important things is having somebody who can walk the dog in a way where you can actually evaluate the gait. So if they're really excited and the dogs are kind of running back and forth and pulling on the leash, that it's really hard to actually tell where they're lame. And so if we can have somebody who's well-trained, a technician um, that is used to doing a gait analysis that can get the dog even practicing going back and forth a couple times so that you can actually get a good view, I think is really important to actually be able to decide which leg is lame, or do we have multiple issues that we need to address during the exam? Is there kind of an ideal speed that you want these patients walking at? Like, is it is it a slow walk or is it kind of that quicker, quicker walk? Um, or does that vary depending on what you're looking for? I think it varies a little bit. Um, usually I'll, I like to watch them going at a walk and at a trot so we can get them going a little bit slower and a little bit faster. If we have dogs that are really excited, uh, maybe it needs to be a faster walk. Um, I just don't want them to pull on the leash, especially for thoracic limb lameness. That can be really hard to identify when they're kind of pulling and and tense the whole time. Um, And even for pelvic limb lameness, we kind of want them walking in a straight direction, not really pulling on it. So if they need to go a little bit faster to see it, they can go a little bit faster. Some of the little tiny dogs, um, you know, for them, maybe a little bit slower is good. When they're going, you know, <laughs> do, 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 like, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, so I really need to slow that down, uh, be able to actually see what leg mm-hmm. is the problem. 
Yeah. Um, that actually reminds me of another thing we spoke about previously, which was, you know, having um, some way to record these uh, gates, you know, the gate analysis, because then you actually can possibly slow it down or, or look at things frame by frame. And that was mm-hmm. one of the best pearls from our previous episode. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. I love so- getting the videos done. <laughs> Exactly. Are there any specific characteristics about the area that are different when you're assessing hind limb lameness versus when you're assessing, you know, the forelimb lameness? And in addition to that, is it ever helpful to have them navigate stairs or uneven surfaces, especially if we're um, not quite sure whether they're lame in the front or the back? Yeah, absolutely. So the pelvic limb lameness, I think the most helpful way to look at them is either from the side or from behind. Um, Thoracic limb lameness, looking at them from the front as they're coming towards you, I think is is most helpful or the side. Um, And so we really want to be able to see how the the hips are moving and kind of how the, the joints and the stride length and all of that is going. So from the side and then walking them, watching them walk away from you. So while you're standing behind them, I think is most helpful for the pelvic limb. Um, sometimes pelvic limb lameness can make it look like they have a thoracic limb lameness, or there might be a thoracic limb lameness and a pelvic limb lameness. So I'll still look at them in both directions just to see. Um, and then the other part of it, I I think it's very helpful to have dogs sometimes do things other than walk in a straight line, especially if you're trying to decide, uh, you know, if it's a really subtle lameness, sometimes it only really happens as they're turning. That's the obvious Mm -hmm. point where you can see it. Or if you're trying to decide, is this orthopedic versus neurologic? You know, do they start to fall a little bit as they turn? That can be really helpful. Uh, We also have reports sometimes from owners where they're only lame in specific scenarios. Um, I previously had a dog that only would occasionally skip as it went up and down stairs. So kind of being able to, to create that, you may be able to pick up on things that are may, may not be as obvious with the dog just going in a straight line. Exactly. Now you had talked about, you know, when they're pulling on the leash, how that can make it a little bit more difficult, especially with thoracic limb lamenesses. I can absolutely see that. We talked about, you know, that that very specific head bob down on sound, you know, on on the front limb. But there actually are some some you know characteristics of the gait abnormality like that with the pelvic limb too, like the like the hip hike or the hip drop. Um, Mm -hmm. And you had talked about, you know, the shorter stride length. So could you describe each of those characteristic movements and explain, you know, what veterinarians need to be looking for when we're looking at the pelvic limb, you know, with each of those specific movements that you're looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So whenever I look at a dog for the pelvic and kind of for the front legs too, Mostly I just look the first time is, is there anything that seems abnormal? Usually with the gait, front legs, back legs, it should be pretty symmetric between the sides. And so I'll just look and see if I think it's, I'll just start normal or abnormal. And then if I think something's abnormal, maybe on the second one, then I'll try to see if there's what that difference is. And with the back end, oftentimes we think of a hip hike or a hip drop. Um, and so you're looking at the at the pelvis, basically, for this portion of it. And just like if we had something that hurt, we wouldn't want to bear our full weight on it. And so you might kind of push off a little bit more with your normal leg so that you don't have to bear as much weight on that painful side. And dogs do the same thing. So they push off and their hips will come up when that lame leg hits the ground. And then when their more comfortable leg comes down, their hips will drop. Sometimes you won't have both of those movements. Um, It seems like sometimes dogs may not necessarily have a hip hike up, but may have a hip drop. And so sometimes it's it's important to see that. And that's where that down on sound comes into, into play. So as their hips come down, that's often the sound leg. And then the stride length goes along with that as well. So if it's uncomfortable, uh, they kind of want to spend a little bit less time on that leg compared to their normal, comfortable legs. So they may have a short stride. Um, And because the joints, if it's joints that hurt, the larger stride you take, the more those joints are going to go through range of motion. And so they may do a little bit of a shorter stride just to help try to get through that gait a little bit faster without putting that 
painful, you know, if it's joint, if it's a joint that's painful without putting that painful joint through more range of motion. I, I love that tip about just normal versus abnormal instead of, you know, getting ahead of yourself and trying to, you know, pinpoint right away where this is, taking that step back and just saying, okay, is this, you know, does this gait look normal or, or mm-hmm. is it abnormal? So I think you could do that. I do that with a lot of, you know, other things as well. Um, EKGs and things like that, normal or abnormal, then we'll go yep. from there. <laughs> yep, exactly. It also, if, in my mind too, it helps to simplify things. So I'm not trying to figure out little intricacies first, but maybe, you know, step by step gets it a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So one thing I do feel like I have a little bit more trouble with is discerning um, hind limb lameness and weakness from true ataxia. You know, um, do you have any tips for clinicians about how to rule out neuromuscular disorders that affect the pelvic limbs? Yeah, and that's such a great point to bring up because I think we're, we have a great neurology service at a and and we often work together really well, right? Because sometimes it's very hard to distinguish, or we have something like a German shepherd that maybe has some lumbosacral disease and bilateral hip dysplasia, and we're trying to figure out which one is causing most of the problems, or is it both of them? Um, and so it can be really challenging. And I think especially if we have dogs that come in with bilateral pelvic limb problems, They look really abnormal and they might be a little bit weak, not want to bear weight on that. And it's really, really challenging. And so usually when we're watching them walk, I think some of what we talked about earlier about doing some different things with the gait, some figures of eight, circles, Mm -hmm. curbs, some of that can be really helpful to try and decide, is this just pain and maybe some weakness or is this dog truly neurologic? And we can see if they start to trip on curbs or if as they're turning, uh, you know, you can sometimes see their legs kind of come out wide as they try to catch themselves or cross over. Um, And other things then is just doing kind of a little bit of a neurologic exam with it. Check for placing, maybe some hopping, check for reflexes and see if we get any abnormalities. In a dog that has bilateral pelvic limb lameness or bilateral hip dysplasia, They might be a little bit short, may not want to walk around as much, but they shouldn't have proprioceptive deficits if that's their only thing. And so if we really are finding other things like back pain, proprioceptive deficits, other neurologic deficits, then we probably have something else going on that's there. And I think it gets even more complicated when we have both orthopedic and neurologic of trying to figure out the best way to help the dog. Um, And maybe even that's warning the owners of we can do something to help them, but we may still have problems afterwards. And so managing those expectations is really important too. That's a very, very good point. So once we have finished our gait examination, then um, you like to do a standing exam, you know, before we lay the dog down and manipulate all of the, the joints and the bones and everything. So what advantages does that standing exam off, offer compared to the recumbent exam? I think the standing exam is super important. Um, one of the things that it can help with, especially if dogs have really subtle lamenesses, is that you can help to try and decide how the dog is bearing weight in the back end. So you may be able to pick up one leg versus the other and see if they're bearing a little bit less weight on it. Um, Other things that it can really help with is symmetry. So if we have a dog that's had a little bit more ongoing lameness, we can always feel the muscle mass on each leg and just subjectively try and decide if one is, is less than the other. Or if we have swelling uh, maybe in a joint or around a tendon or, or bone or something, it's really great to have the other leg to compare, especially if it's something that's more subtle uh, and we're not maybe not quite sure if it's abnormal, we can get that comparison. The other thing I think is really helpful is to feel the patellas in that location as well. Because if we're thinking about a patellar luxation, I really want to know where that patella is sitting when the dog is in a normal standing position with those muscles activated. Because sometimes that can be a little bit different compared to when they're recumbent or when they're sedated. And so being able to kind of get get a picture of what's happening as the dog's using using those muscles is really important. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. 
Do you find or do you keep in mind any particular breed differences in conformation? You know, for some reason, you know, to me, there's certainly like the way that the pelvic limbs look and are angled is different in something like a German shepherd to me than something like a pit bull, um, Mm -hmm. where they, they always seem to be a little bit more up and down. Do you find that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, <laughs> I think some of the German shepherds, it's it can be things that people kind of breed for and look for. Um, and so they definitely have a different conformation. And so of, oftentimes with those, um, to make sure that, it, you know, the German shepherds look a little bit sometimes more sunken. Um, and so just making sure that you're doing the rest of the evaluation before deciding if it's something that's abnormal and clinically significant, kind of seeing if the rest of your exam fits in with that. Or we, can we find pain in any of these joints? Does it seem like all of our tendons or, you know, calcanean tendon is intact? Um, or, you know, is this just normal for the dog or is it something that we need to focus in more um, and do more diagnostics? Um, but yeah, absolutely. And, and sometimes the, the pities kind of look more upright. Sometimes you get the pitties mm-hmm. that have a little bit more bow legs too. Um, and so all that kind of adds in a little bit. <laughs> and then bulldogs, yeah. my, my goodness, oh, let's not get yeah, started bulldog. on bulldogs. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so barring, you know, some of those kind of extreme breed examples, what, what do you consider, what's a considered a normal standing angle for like the hawk joint? And then if we could discuss a few conditions, because there are some very notable ones that can, can cause changes to that angle. Yeah, absolutely. So normal standing angle for the dog, somewhere around 135 degrees, somewhere at 135, 145. And so some of it can have some variability. Good part about dogs, again, if they have a normal other leg, you have something to compare. So that that patient's normal is hopefully in the other leg. Um, but sometimes we can have cases where they the hawk drops a little bit. And so usually when it's dropped and related to orthopedic things, I start to worry about something's happened that we lost plantar support for that hawk. That could be the common calcaneal tendon, either a partial or a complete tear. That may mean a fracture of one of the tarsal bones, or it could be rupturing of the plantar ligaments, which can lead to some subluxation or luxation at the tarsal joints. And so your exam can kind of give you a little bit better idea of where, at what level is this problem occurring? Do we have swelling around the tendon that would indicate we have an issue there? Or is that swelling localized a little bit more distally, actually over the hock joint? Um, And that palpation to check for any instability there can be really helpful. Um, Other things that can happen is we can sometimes have hocks that are a little bit more upright, so almost looking a little bit more straight. Um, In some cases, if we have a dog that has a bilateral pelvic limb lameness, and I think a lot of times we can see this with bilateral hip dysplasia, Mm -hmm. they may be trying so hard to shift weight onto that front part of their body that their hocks may actually be almost straight or even hyperextended. And they look really abnormal. Um, And they are a little bit abnormal because they're not sitting at the right angle, but the actual problem for the dogs is a little bit higher on the legs, stifles, or even the the hips in there. And so again, that's one where we can tie that standing exam in with the rest of our recumbent exam and see if we can localize where the issue is coming from. That's great. And then what about the stifle? What's um, kind of same questions for the stifle? What's the normal standing angle for the stifle? What do we see, you know, what conditions do we see that angle change with? Yeah, and so the stifle is actually pretty similar. The normal standing angle is around 135. Um, And again, some dogs are a little bit different, but you hopefully have another normal leg to compare. Mm -hmm. Um, I think some of the ones, especially when we start to see some excessive slopes for the tibial plateau, Um, Those dogs tend to stand with the stifle a little bit more flexed than normal, um, just because of the way their femur and their tibia articulate. So they look a little bit abnormal. In that case, if both of their stifles have excessive slopes, it may look symmetric, but still be abnormal compared to a a normal dog. Um, Other things, if like we talked about German shepherds, may walk with a little bit more crouched stance. 
Um, and if they have any issues where they have some painful range of motion in the knees um, or, you know, reasons where they can't fully extend or flex the stifle, that may change some of their stance. Um, or if they have something even like a tear in the patellar tendon where they can't kind of fully extend their stifle and, and bear weight on it, that may show up as a kind of a dropped angle of the stifle. Moving on to that recumbent exam, this, uh, in our previous episode, we talked uh, quite a bit about the importance of starting palpation distally, working up the leg, having a methodical, you know, examination every single time, um, because it's very difficult to isolate the proximal joints without also manipulating those distal joints. And so if you haven't started looking for reactions and pain distally, um, you know, once you get higher up the limb, it, it can be confounding when you try to manipulate those joints. Um, in the, uh, the pair of articles you have, you have this really nice little acronym too. And I love acronyms. I love mm-hmm. mnemonics. I love little <laughs> songs that help me remember. So could yeah. you talk to the audience a little bit about how we should be systematically evaluating the leg and each joint? Yeah. And so I, it, it is really important going from distal to proximal. And I think most of the cases we have, not all of them, but so many cases have knee problems and maybe hip problems. And so being able to actually kind of work through and try to figure out which one of these is is causing the problem, I think is really important. Um, And I can't take credit for this acronym. I learned it, I think in school, but it was, it's CREPI. So C-R-E-P-I. Um, and it's for evaluating the joints. So every joint we come to, whether it's the digit joints, the hock, the knee, the hip, we're going to look for crepitus on range of motion, evaluate the range of motion. So does this have a normal range of motion? Does it move in abnormal ways? Um, uh, effusion, forgetting my acronym. Yes, effusion. So is there swelling around this joint? And again, using that other side for a comparison, if there's kind of subtle changes that are there, is there any pain on palpation, uh, either kind of palpating on range of motion or just palpating around the joint um, or instability? And so making sure we're moving through that normal range of motion, but also checking the collateral ligaments to see if they have any instability that's there. Um, The other thing that's really important to on that pain, on that palpation, is making sure that we have pain, if we're thinking about a joint, make sure it's in the joint and not surrounding it too. We know we can have bone tumors, fractures, things like that, that can cause discomfort. You know, if it's a younger dog, HOD or pain osteitis, we want to make sure that we can actually localize where that discomfort and that pain is coming from. And so making sure it's joint related and not bone related is really important, especially for thinking about next diagnostic steps. Absolutely. Yep. And I think just stressing that really systematic thing, I would say, I definitely have had times in my career, one jumps out um, and (laughs) it was a dog that had uh, ruptured its cruciate ligament, had surgery with our local surgeon, was doing great, came in lame on the other leg. And so I had just prepared to talk them through this again. Oh my gosh, we're going to have to go for surgery again and everything. And I went right to the knee and, and, and started feeling and started prepping the owner and the owner was like, did you see his big swollen toe dog? Yeah. <laughs> he, had, he had absolutely fractured one of his, oh, his no. toes. And so I was, so just remember, start with the basic, you know, yes. and move up the limb. Um, because it's, um, it's easy, especially when, you know, you're in practice and things are moving so quickly to jump to those, you know, like you said, those ones we see all the time, which is definitely yeah. knees and hips. I see knees and hips every day, you know, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's so funny um, with that story because I feel like it's probably happened with everybody. And we had a a cat, too, that came in. It had a partial tarsal arthrodesis and came in because it was lame, I don't know, six weeks after surgery. We all kind of honed in on the tarsus. Um, And thankfully, we, we did kind of work through everything else. And it turned out the cat had luxated its hip. I don't know how it did it because it was supposed to have exercise restriction after surgery, mm-hmm. but it managed to luxate its hip afterwards. But yeah, it's it's very easy. And I think if you have especially those short appointment times and got people mm-hmm. waiting and things to do. Um, but yeah, animals, animals do weird things. 
and they can't tell us what's going on. <laughs> so very helpful. Always kind of toes, toes it up. Toes it up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're busy. Your CE needs to be easy, easy to earn and easy to track. Clinician's Brief CE is highly relevant and now more convenient than ever. Study online, from home, or on the go, and always at your own pace. Courses are race approved and designed with your busy schedule in mind. Start your next course today at cliniciansbrief.com CE. dive in now after the break to some of these specific tests. Um, You gave us some great pointers on different tests for the thoracic limb. Um, I think obviously pelvic limb, you know, we were talking before the break, hips, knees, so ortolani, cranial drawer, these are like bread and butter. I think that people do a lot of a lot of the time and very familiar to most practitioners. But like any diagnostic tool, they are going to have limitations. So what factors do you find affect the accuracy and interpretation of those particular tests? Yeah, that's a great question. And I I think I'll I'll start with the well, I guess I'll say something globally about both of them, then we can talk about them individually. Um, I think that they're both, you know, checking for cranial drawer, checking for ortolani are fantastic things to do. And the biggest thing to remember is that absence of either of those doesn't rule out disease in that joint. So absence of cranial drawer doesn't mean that the cruciate ligament's intact. And absence of an ortolani doesn't mean that you don't have hip dysplasia. Um, Getting them means that you do, you you know, it is easier to make your diagnosis, um, but it doesn't rule it out. And so, especially with cranial drawer, things that can impact your ability to, to feel for it. Number one, maybe there isn't any. We might have a really, really early CCL tear, or we have a really chronic one, just a lot of scar tissue that gets laid down, and maybe we don't feel instability. Or we have one of those dogs that's either so excited or so angry to be at the vet that their muscles are tense, they're flailing, they're fighting. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to get a good a good feel of that to assess for instability. And so getting some sedation on board may help um, to actually fully assess it. And then if you don't have any instability, looking for other signs that would point to the knee as a source of pain and other signs that a CCL might be an issue is helpful. And so often those dogs with really early tears may have a little bit of effusion in the joint and are often really painful when you fully extend the knee and then give a little bit of extra pressure, kind of just trying to hyperextend just a little bit. And often that's the, those are the first signs that you have. And that enough would be enough for me to say, you know, pain is localized to the knee. We have pain on hyperextension, which often happens with CCL tears. And so that would be enough to target diagnostics and treatment into that joint. Um, with the hip, some of it's pretty similar. So if we can get an ortolani that tells us that there's laxity within the hip, um, and then we can go from there. If we don't get an ortolani, maybe the hip is normal, or maybe the dog is getting older and we have some scar tissue that's gotten laid down and that starts to tighten it up as they, as they age. The other thing with the ortolani and hip dysplasia and progression of arthritis is sometimes it's hard to predict what that's going to do in the future. So if we have a dog that's not really clinical for, for uh, hip dysplasia, but we are assessing for it or, or we're looking for it, if they have laxity, uh, we know that they have hip dysplasia and they're probably going to develop arthritis, but I don't necessarily know how much arthritis or how clinical that dog is going to be in the future. And so I think it's a useful piece of information, useful tool. And certainly if the dog's clinical for it and we don't have any other abnormalities on the limb, then we can use it to guide our treatment. Um, But a a positive ortolani kind of in and of itself in a non-clinical dog may may not necessarily mean something that needs aggressive treatment. 
Um, and so we usually, I usually check all dogs if they have an Ortolani when they're sedated. Um, and I think usually sedation is kind of the way to go when you're trying to feel for it. Um, and so, you know, mostly I, I'm checking because I want to know if they have laxity, but also so students can feel for it if they do have it. Um, and certainly if they're younger ones and we want to intervene, um, then it's great to have that diagnosis early on. That's another great tip. It's something that I wish people, somebody would have um, pulled me aside and said quite a bit earlier in my career. It's something that I started doing a lot later. Um, but when I have patients that are in, especially patients that, you know, are being spayed or neutered or, you know, sedated for something else like an ultrasound is to just start feeling, you know, all of those things to get more because the more normals you can feel, you know, absolutely the better. And it's something I wish I had been doing all the way from the beginning of my 20 year career, but I definitely do it all the time now. You know, I'm like, yeah. I'm going to find each kidney and yeah. I'm going <laughs> to palpate the bladder and I'm going to yeah. <laughs> go well, through all of this. So I agree. And I remember the first time I tried, I mean, you know, first time I palpated an abdomen, I was like, I don't know, there's mm -hmm. squishy bits everywhere. Like, I don't know what I'm feeling. Um, and so <laughs> just the more, you know, pets at home when you're feeling them, mm -hmm. you can, it's great to feel those normal joints or abnormal ones if your pet has them. Um, and the more, the more you feel, the easier it gets. And I think the more you do it, the easier it is to remember to do it as well. Um, but yeah, I absolutely like you have to know the normal before you can feel the, the abnormal ones. You had already talked a little bit about how you really like to uh, palpate those patella when they are standing, um, but let's let's talk a little bit more about patellar luxation because this is another really common one I see, and I feel like it has a really broad range of clinical presentation. Um, and so, you know, what are the? Um, can you just provide an overview of how you assess for patellar luxation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, just like we said before, I usually feel while they're standing up just to see kind of what the patella, where it is when their muscles are activated. And then I'll use kind of three things in order to guide how I grade them. The first is where's the patella sitting normally? When I first put my hands on the dog, is it in the groove or out of the groove? The second is whether it's in or out, I'll try to push it the opposite direction. So apply manual pressure. So if it's in the groove, I'll manually try to luxate it. And then if it's out, we'll manually try to put it back in. And then the third piece of information is once I remove that pressure, where does the patella go? If I've pushed it out manually and removed that pressure, does it pop back in or does it stay out of the groove? And so a grade one patellar luxation, that patella is in the groove when I first touch the animal. I can apply manual pressure and pop it out, but when I remove that pressure, it pops back in right away. That grade two is the patella sitting in the groove normally. Manually, I can apply pressure, pop it out. When I release that pressure, it might stay out for a little bit until maybe the dog starts moving around. It can adjust a little bit and then it might pop back in. A grade three, then the patella is sitting outside of the groove. Manually, I can apply pressure to move it back into the groove. But as soon as I release that pressure, it pops right back out. And then a grade four is just out the whole time. So it's sitting out of the groove. I can't, no matter how hard I try, get it back in. And then release the pressure, it stays out the whole time. Um, and being able to have that grade, I think, is really important. The, the other... Um, differentiation between a grade one and a grade two would be that grade one is usually a non-clinical. So if we kind of, we can manually luxate it, but it pops right back in, that dog's probably not having any signs at home. And that's more just of a kind of a, an exam finding versus the grade two, those dogs are going to have spontaneous luxation um, and are more likely going to be the ones then that have not always, but ones that the owners are going to report are having some clinical signs at home. And then how do you use that information in order to guide like whether or not you're recommending surgery and does that change based on how big the dog is? Yeah, that's a great question too. And so I would say yes, absolutely. So the biggest thing for me is whether or not to do surgery is, is this dog having clinical signs at home? And so most of the time, by the time they come in to see us, the dog's having some clinical signs. So usually those grade one luxations that the owners don't report any issues, 
um, but it's just a, an exam finding, are not ones that we would be doing any surgery on. Um, but if we have a grade two, usually in higher, then those would be more likely to, to be ones that we would recommend surgery. The other thing with the patellar luxations, as we go higher up in grade, they're more likely to have other skeletal abnormalities that are helping to contribute, uh, more angular limb deformities contributing to the luxation. And so if we think about patellar luxation, we, we talk about it like it's a problem with the patella, like it's the patella's fault that it's not sitting where it's supposed to be. But in actuality, like that's part of the quadriceps mechanism. We have the quadriceps muscle, the patella, patellar tendon attaching onto the tuberosity. That muscle, that tendon, it's not going to make any weird turns uh, unless there's been some weird trauma there. But it, it's going to go pretty much straight down. And so the problem is actually with some of the bones underneath, right? So our tibular tuberosity isn't quite where it's meant to be. Maybe our groove is really shallow. Maybe we have some femoral varus contributing to that. And as we go up into our grade three and grade four patellar luxations, those changes to the bones are more likely to be more severe and more significant and more likely to require treatment, um, doing something like a femoral osteotomy uh, in order to get that limb straight so that our patella can lie within our groove and stay there. The other thing as we're going up into our grade threes and grade fours is these are really hard to get radiographs of, right? So our grade two patellar luxations, we can get some radiographs. Uh, they're pretty well positioned. We can get measurements for surgery. It's great. In a grade four, I mean, sometimes the patella is like back behind the femur, right? And so that means that it's going to be pulling your tibia in a weird direction. You're not going to be able to get straight radiographs of the bones, or maybe you can in just like, a, you know, it might take 50 x-rays to get there. And so in those cases, getting a CT scan can be really helpful to kind of fully assess, do we have to, you know, how much femoral varus do we have? Do we actually have femoral or tibial torsion that's contributing to this patellar luxation? And depending on the degree and the size of the dog, because I think the larger breed dogs, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive with doing um, other osteotomies to try to get things aligned. Um, but a CT scan will often give us more information and more accurate information on whether or not we need to do other procedures for that. Yeah, that is a really interesting way to think about that because just like you said, that's how I've always kind of, it's the patella's fault. The poor patella is yeah. getting blamed for things that aren't its fault. It is. It's trying its hardest. <laughs> so, it wants to go home. <laughs> um, so I actually had a case when I was in vet school on my large animal rotation with a miniature foal that had a lateral patellar luxation, but I have never seen this in the dog, but my understanding is it does occur. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was, you know, just wondering about those luxations. Are they common in certain breeds or are they usually congenital, um, those lateral luxations? Yeah. And so any dog, large breed, small breed, medial patellar luxations are certainly more common and definitely the ones that we see most often. Larger breed dogs overall may be more likely to get a lateral patellar luxation, um, that being said, the last one that I saw, which was a, a couple months ago, was about a three kilogram dog. So it was tiny. Um, so it can certainly happen. Um, it was a very weird case. It had on one leg a lateral patellar luxation and on its other leg, it had a lateral and a medial patellar luxation. It was just kind of moving everywhere. Um, so it can certainly do weird things. Um, mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we can get dogs where basically if, if we know that it's a breeder that's bringing it in or if they got it as a puppy and, and maybe it kind of came out that way. But I think often we have dogs that have um, bones that as, the, as they grow, as their skeleton matures, they have some of the, you know, a little bit more varus for a medial patellar luxation or, or some other kind of change in the way that the bone forms that then causes the patella to run outside of the groove. And so kind of more of a developmental issue with it. Um, but certainly not as common, um, but always good to check for it, even in the smaller breed dogs, because apparently, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they can get them to you. And the, yeah, the one with the medial and the lateral, that was a, that was certainly a first for me. I had, I yep. had not seen that before. <laughs> so that was an interesting case. <laughs> never say never. Cause they're yep, going to throw exactly. it at you. <laughs> um, 
So this, you know, might be a good place to kind of slip in this question uh, since we're talking about stifles with the with the patella, but also with cruciates, I will find that a common question that I get from clients is about bracing the knee. And I think that's because, you know, we use leg braces and knee braces so much with people. Um, and so I have always kind of tried to to explain to clients that because, you know, dogs walk on four legs, it's really difficult to get that same mechanical support in a brace. But I do know that there are, you know, braces out there that um, are designed specifically for dogs, something that you actually, they want measurements taken from, you know, the bones in order to try to fit them. And so I was just curious as to your opinion about those braces um, and if you have anything, you know, any tips or tricks for our audience audience there. Yeah. Um, and this is certainly an opinion. It's not, Oh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't speak for every, you know, <laughs> everybody everywhere. My opinion as a warning, um, I have not seen as good, um, evidence that they're very helpful. And so in some cases where we have dogs that really are unstable, but can't undergo surgery for what, you know, health reasons or, or whatever, that it may be something that, that we could try. Um, but I think because of the, the angle that the dog walks at with the knee, because of the motion is a little bit more kind of subtle and small that we have a really hard time with the braces actually being able to eliminate and provide stability for that knee. Um, and so I, I haven't been uh, it, it's not something that I, I would uh, necessarily jump on. We've had a couple of clients um, that have gotten it uh, elsewhere and come in and have, you know, kind of said it, it hasn't really helped too much. Um, I'm sure that there are some out there that have ended up, um, have gotten it and maybe have done fine with it. And, and those aren't the ones that we have usually that are coming in to see us next. Um, and so I'm sure it may be, reasonable for some people. I, I know that some of the cost uh, can be significant, especially if we're doing ones that are custom fabricated for them mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so having owners uh, be prepared for that also, I, I, I think uh, is sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes a bigger deal than people think, you know, it's not necessarily just going and getting a neoprene sleeve out to help them. Um, so I think in, in general, for if we have a dog that we're suspicious of a, a CCL tear and we have a lot of instability and, and the dog is otherwise would be healthy enough for surgery. I think having a surgery to stabilize the joint would be the, the best recommendation for the dog. Um, but like I said, if, if we have a, an animal that for whatever reason, that's, that may not be an option, especially health wise, a, you know, anesthesia and all that, if it's not going to work and they are looking for something uh, that may be an okay option to try, it's just not going to, um, I think, help as much for stability and comfort as surgery would. The other thing that it, it wouldn't help with is if we have something like a meniscal tear, um, I think mm -hmm. that's gonna be kind of a continued source of discomfort for the dog um, that wouldn't be addressed necess necessarily by just having a brace in place. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. So as we wrap up, before we wrap up, I do want to talk a little bit about next steps. Um, you know, after we've walked, gone through, walked through, no pun mm -hmm. intended, yeah. our, like our whole orthopedic exam. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about imaging modalities because you did say, you know, there we have so much available to us. We have ultrasound, we have CT, we have MRI, not necessarily in, you know, my general practice, you know, we're doing a lot of radiographs, but what imaging modalities are we commonly using once we have, you know, to further our, our diagnostic processes, you know, once we've done our full lameness exam and, and localized where we need to be looking at? Yeah. And I think radiographs, um, like you said, at your, you have at your practice, that's probably the mainstay of what we're using on our joints um, and the bones too. If we are suspicious that there's something like a common calcaneum tendon tear, that's more soft tissue. Um, sometimes radiographs can still help be helpful. Maybe there's an avulsion from your calcaneus. Um, in those cases though, also an ultrasound would probably be one of the next steps just to see 
the location of the tear? Is more of the tendon actually damaged than we think? Are there core lesions throughout it? Um, ultrasound can be really helpful there. Um, in some cases, again, like we have a medial patellar luxation, that's a grade four. A CT would probably be um, the step to go rather than trying to get radiographs on it. Um, but certainly um, radiographs to start with can be helpful. Um, even if we're looking at, you know, if we, it's, it's a, a weird thing sometimes to talk to owners about, because especially if you have cranial drawer in the knee and you kind of have your diagnosis, you know, why are we mm-hmm. getting radiographs? You know what's going on. Um, and I would say even for those cases, even if we're doing an extra capsular repair, it's really important to get radiographs and get images of that, that knee to just make sure that there's nothing else going on. Um, I have seen a one and a half year old dog that had a joint tumor that it had cranial drawer, but it was because that tumor had kind of eroded through the, the origin of the cranial cruciate ligament. And so just making sure that there's nothing else weird going on in that leg. Um, and I always yeah. find it really helpful when dogs come in with radiographs because it lets us start the conversation with the owners after the referral. You know, if we see a dog with an excessive slope or some weird shape to its tibia and we're trying to address the CCL, it's nice to have that kind of a heads up um, before we start getting into things. Yeah, I have absolutely also had the case with a dog with a very prominent drawer sign that ended up having a sarcoma. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, those radiographs can be really crucial. Mm-hmm. Um, actually that segue is right into my final, you know, kind of question and topic for you. And that is considering, um, you know, radiograph and staff safety. So I've really seen this dedicated push in recent years to move away from manually restraining patients during, you know, radiographs completely. So, um, what, how are you, how do you guys do that at Texas A&M? You know, what are your recommendations on when these animals need to be sedated or even have general anesthesia in order to obtain these x-rays? Yeah. And so all of our patients that are coming in for imaging are going to be sedated or anesthetized. Um, It helps the, you know, the university especially is very uh, big on Alara and making sure that everybody's as safe as possible, which is great, right? Like if Mm -hmm. we don't need to be exposed even to the scatter radiation on a daily basis, then we're probably doing something good for our health long-term. And so most of ours are going to get dexmedetomidine and butorphanol. Um, Most of the animals coming in are young and relatively healthy. Uh, We do sometimes get dogs that are coming in that maybe have heart disease or maybe um, cannot handle dexmedetomidine and we may have to adjust those a little bit. Um, In some cases, we've had some bulldogs or dogs with a lot of health issues that we really didn't want to just sedate for radiograph. So we've gone ahead with anesthesia, make sure you have an airway controlled. And sometimes that's even easier as well. If you can do a quick anesthesia, get the diagnostics you need, either if you're planning on surgery after you might be able to go right in, or you can wake the dog up and go over everything. Um, But I think it's also very helpful for trying to get straight images too, that you're not trying to fight with a dog. And if you have them sedated and you need to make a slight adjustment, it's a little bit easier to do it while they're asleep because hopefully they're going to stay put and you can adjust versus if they're awake and kind of trying to move away every time you've taken a taken an image and then come back. Um, so I think it's it's really helpful for getting good quality images and then also very helpful just for for safety of people working at the vet hospital. Absolutely. So Well, that brings us to the end of our episode, and you have been a guest before, so you are already familiar with our rapid fire segment, (laughs) Um, but would you want to answer some more would you rather questions before we go today? absolutely. All right. Excellent. First question, would you rather go forward in time 100 years and practice in the future or go backwards in time 100 years and practice in the 1920s? Oh my goodness. Can I bring people with me? Can I like bring a team and a family with me? I think you can definitely bring your family. I'm going to say, and and I would say, yes, you can bring, I don't know. Are you going forward or backward? (laughs) Well, I don't know. I was thinking backwards might be cool because then I'd know a lot of new stuff and, you know, would be super cool. 
Um, mm-hmm. But then if I brought my family, maybe the rest of human medical care wouldn't have caught up. Um, mm-hmm. And so I might want to go into the future just to see what's there, um, assuming we, it's not like a post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> But I guess I wouldn't know until I get there. You never know, right? (laughs) You never know. (laughs) Wow, that went way deeper than I meant that question to be. I thought very, very much into that very quickly. (laughs) I'm going to continue thinking about this probably after the podcast. (laughs) Okay. Um, Next question. Would you rather continue teaching? but no longer perform surgery or continue being a surgeon, but no longer teach students? That's a really hard question. I don't even know what I would, I don't know. I think in order to be a good teacher, you should still be doing surgery. And then I don't, uh, I don't know. I'd want to still be a, a good, maybe I'd keep doing surgery and sneakily find a way to teach people. To teach people. Yeah, and then like keep learning. I, I'm not doing very well on these questions. I'm making my it's, own answer. It's I'll do okay. surgery and sneak students in so they can learn. <laughs> right. You will build like a big open air or, or at least windows everywhere so that it can be sterile, you know, and oh, just yeah. let people come observe doing surgery. Yeah, that'd be perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, would you rather perform surgery on your own pet or would you rather have a trusted colleague do it? Oh, I've actually been in both of these scenarios. I, mm-hmm. my dog, uh, they're both, unfortunately they have passed away, but my dog, uh, shortly after I got to Texas A&M tore his cruciate and needed a TPLO surgery. And so I actually did his surgery, but I made one of the other faculty scrub in with me in case I just got nervous. They could like kick right. me out of the way and finish it. Um, and then my other dog, um, unfortunately had osteosarcoma and needed an amputation. And so in that case, I asked somebody else to do it as I was like sobbing in a corner. So probably, probably if it was something simple and they were otherwise healthy, I would still continue to do it. But if it was something Mm -hmm. more serious, I'd I'd ask somebody else to. That makes, yep. That's, I think that's a lot of us. I had very, something very similar with my own dog. Um, so if you hard when your were own pet atten- gets sick. it is hard with your own pets. Sometimes I feel like my brain just shuts off with my own pets. Yeah. You know, so, I um but- my my cat got sorry. I'm like derailing. No, my cat yeah. got sick. Was vomiting was a couple of years ago. I brought her in, did uh-huh. radiographs, ultrasound. We couldn't really find anything. And I went to one of the internists and told him about the history. And I was like, I just need help. Mm-hmm. I don't know. His first question was, "How was your physical exam?" And I was like, "What?" <laughs> I, t- I skipped that part. <laughs> Give me five minutes. I'll be back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. This one, if you were attending a party and a whole bunch of the guests that you don't know uh, were talking about their pets, would you out yourself as a veterinary surgeon or would you make up some other profession? <laughs> no, I'd probably just make something up unless they, I, I, I don't. I don't know that I would like specifically lie, but I do not usually volunteer. <laughs> volunteer that information. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Last, last question. And you know, the last one is always the one that's the most fun. <laughs> so if Cerberus, the three headed dog had to have surgery for acute abdomen, would you give each head its own e-collar or would you put like a giant e-collar around all three heads? I don't know if we have one big enough, so he might need three e collars. He might need three. <laughs> yeah, that way, if he turns it around, we he'd have each one protected. Mm-hmm. Well, because I feel like they'd all fight inside that e collar anyway. They I'm probably not sure he gets would. Along yeah, they need heads. to be separate. Yeah. They can like conspire with each other. <laughs> no, separate. <laughs> okay that was it um i'm sorry some of my my uh would you rather questions took a a deep turn they're supposed to be i love them they are fun i like it great good well i loved having you both episodes this is fantastic please write some more things so we can have you on again okay thank you for having me i appreciate it always a pleasure thank you all for listening to today's episode of clinicians brief the podcast If you enjoyed this episode, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, including a video version that we have on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review us. 
You can also listen to or watch our podcast episodes on our website at cliniciansbrief.com slash podcasts. Or if you'd like, drop us a line at podcasts at vetmedics.com. Clinicians Brief the Podcast is a Vet Medics production produced by Alexis Ussery and hosted by me, Dr. Alyssa Watson.